This is Counterpoint. The deal legitimated the nuclear program of Iran while turning a blind eye, in fact, facilitating, I think, the rise of Iranian power on the ground. Seeing Iran not only as a sponsor of terrorism in, in the neighboring region, but also uh, as, as a hostile country that have assassinated and attempted to assassinate people here in European soil. Welcome to another episode of Counterpoint, recorded from the TV studios of the European Parliament. Last May's decision by the Trump administration to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal dramatically intensified tensions between the Western partners. But the importance of the transatlantic relationship and the seriousness of the Iranian threat would demand that Europe and the US try their utmost to find common ground. What exactly are the challenges posed by the Islamic Republic and what are the chances that Europe and the US will close ranks on this crucial issue? With me in the studio to discuss these questions are Mike Duran, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute and a former Senior Director at the National Security Council of the George W. Bush Administration, and Danish MEP for the ECR Group, Anders Wistesen, who is a Vice Chair of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Mike, perhaps first to you. The Iranian nuclear deal is held here in Brussels as a major diplomatic breakthrough. Can you perhaps briefly explain for our viewers why you and other critics and predominantly the Trump administration have such a different view of the deal? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, I think the, it's dramatic, actually, the difference in, in feeling in Washington and in, and in Europe. Um, because I think here in, in Brussels and um, uh, especially in, uh, in Berlin, it was the JCPOA was a kind of uh, victory for European diplomacy and for multilateral diplomacy and for, in European eyes, a diplomatic solution to, uh, um, to a major national security challenge that uh, could lead to war. Um, and I, I noticed when the JCPOA was being negotiated that uh, a lot of the arguments against it in Washington had no purchase here whatsoever. In fact, I think a lot of Europeans didn't even hear them. But the, the, the critique against the JCPOA, which at the time it was made, was not simply a, a right-wing or Republican critique. It had bipartisan support. Um, that has changed over time because President Obama made it part of his legacy and now the Democrats have embraced it. But uh, when it was being negotiated, the problem with it was, was that it was seen as a, basically um, a strengthening of Iran, uh, both, both simultaneously in the nuclear arena and in, the, um, in terms of the, uh, the advance of Iranian power on the ground in, in the region. Uh, um, of course, the administration, the Obama administration, sold it as purely an arms control negotiation that had no influence on the balance of power on the ground in places like Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. But it obviously did. They, the, the, the Obama administration was loath to take any action while it was negotiating the deal um, to try to contain Iran on the ground. And in fact, it facilitated the creation of what we now call the land bridge. That's the Iranian um, military and political influence from Baghdad uh, to Beirut. Um, and it, in the nuclear arena, it legitimated Iran's program. And the big critique um, in the United States is about the, the sunsets. You know, within, within 10 years, uh, approximately, the, all of the restrictions on Iran's nuclear program evaporate, and Iran will be free then to do whatever it, it wants. So we, we be, the, the, the deal legitimated the nuclear program of Iran while turning a blind eye, in fact, facilitating, I think, the rise of Iranian power on the ground. Right. But, okay, so now the U.S. Administ administration withdrew about a year ago from the deal. What is the game plan? What is the administration hoping, trying to achieve? Well, there's a, there's a debate going on within the administration about uh, what it's trying to achieve and, and, and how to achieve it. And this, this, the simple answer is that it's now carrying out a containment policy against Iran, a containment policy designed to stop Iranian power on the ground um, and to renegotiate um, the, nuclear, uh, the nuclear agreement so that it will be closer to what the Security Council resolutions envisioned 
when they said that you know, the enrichment and reprocessing was unacceptable uh, uh, by by Iran. At least it will, it would. What the administration hopes is to negotiate a deal in which there will be no uh, possibility of Iran using its nuclear program in, in in order to build a bomb, or the or, or the possibility will be minimal, and the restrictions will be more or less. Uh, more or less permanent. Uh, there's a there's a debate though going on in the administration about how to how best to achieve that. Um, some some elements in the administration, particularly in the career bureaucracy, want to come closer to the Europeans. The hardliners in the administration want to um, uh, want to reimpose sanctions across the board with no waivers and no exceptions. All right. Now, um, in your assessment, um, do you think it's realistic that the uh, administration will achieve its goal um, in this term, within these remaining two years, or does success depend on uh, Trump's re-election? In, in my view, it, it depends on Trump's re-election. Uh, you know, all, all things being equal, unless we have a sort of dramatic collapse of the regime in Tehran, which I have no reason to believe that that's going to happen. But the, what the administration has succeeded in doing is, uh, is reimposing significant sanctions and imposing very, uh, very serious financial uh, uh, costs on, economic costs on, on the regime for, for its behavior. It has not succeeded in putting together a, um, I, I would say, a robust containment strategy on the ground in, in the Middle East. I mean, it's really only the Israelis and the Saudis, or the, the, the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen and the Israelis in Syria, who are really, uh, are really competing with the Iranians on the ground. We're, we're not really doing that. Um, so uh, the, those economic costs that, that the United States is imposing, they're, they're significant, but I don't think they're going to achieve the goal within the next two years. Right. And as, um, as Mike just said, there was there used to be consensus in the United States that that the, the deal has many flaws, but but there also was a very lively and informed debate uh, mm -hmm. at the time that was carried out in the op-ed pages of major newspapers, in among think tanks. Uh, there was a debate in Congress and actually a vote which was uh, against the deal, but there was nothing of the kind um, in, in, in Europe. Um, why hasn't there been a, a proper debate about this in, in, here in Europe? I, I think there's a multi multitude of factors that's playing in, in, into that. First of all, um, the Europeans are not accustomed to make tough security choices uh, outside of even inside Europe, we saw that in the Balkans in the 90s. So, so there is not this robustness to be ready to assert uh, military power when, or potentially assert military power if needed. The other thing is that Obama was a very popular president in, in the European frame, and this this uh, deal have been labeled an, an Obama deal here as well. And at the same time, uh, the withdrawal from the from the from the deal have been labeled a Trump thing, and Trump is contrary quite unpopular in many mm. European countries. So instead of looking at the facts on the ground namely that the, the democratically elected House and Senate rejected the deal in, in a quite bipartisan way. It has been labeled as, uh, if you're with Obama, you're in favor of the deal. If you're with Trump, you're against the deal, and therefore you defend the deal to a certain extent. That is the mechanism I see play here in Europe to a large extent. Not so much the actual content of the deal and what ramification it might have in our, even our national security, if you also see in Iran, not only as a sponsor of terrorism in, in the neighboring region against their own people, but also uh, as, as a hostile country that have assassinated and attempted to assassinate people here in European soil. Right, right. More about this in a moment. But um, so that explains perhaps the initial reaction now um, to, you know, given, given Trump's uh, unpopularity. But, but, you know, there are some very, very concrete uh, criticism about yeah. the deal. As, as Mike laid it out, there is a sunset clause, yeah. um, the major restrictions will fall away, etc. Is, is that all in your mind, that is, why, why Europeans are, are, are sticking with it? Let, let, uh, I actually think there's not been very much enlightened debate about mm. it. And I think it's also a bit problematic, as Mike laid out before, that there is actually like a dual message coming out of Washington. There is the hawks that are saying to the Europeans, you have to stand with us on this issue, this is a common security threat. And then you have voices maybe in the more established uh, diplomacy and the more car career diplomacy of the US who are putting down the message uh, sort of under the table that, oh, it's fine that we have like a good cop, bad cop uh, kind 
kind of situation and maybe Europe can be used as a go-between if there has to be some negotiations done. So so it also struggles a little bit that it doesn't seem like the American side are sending a very clear and one message to the Europeans about this. Actually, if you talk with people in the EAS or people in this house, they would say, oh, secretly the Americans would like us to keep this deal alive because then they get the best of both worlds. They can seem tough on Iran at the same time as we are keeping deal in place. So there is also this, this, this problem, as I see it, as a problem mm. of perception. That's actually a good question, uh, Mike. Is that, is that true? I mean, uh, isn't it ultimately in uh, even the Trump administration's interest that the Europeans, by trying to uh, um, keep the deal alive, make it more difficult for the Iranians to withdraw as well? Isn't it ultimately in the interest that the Iranians stay within uh, these uh, may be flawed, but still, you know, there are constraints uh, uh, better than if they now were trying to uh, dash for the bomb. Uh, I wouldn't see it that way, actually. Uh, I, let, let me just say, I totally agree with the point that, that Anders made. I think it's a very good one about a lack of an American, uh, the, the Americans not speaking with a single voice. And I'd add one more voice to it as well, because the, um, uh, the, the Democrats, um, and in particular, the former Obama officials, like uh, like John Kerry, uh, the former Secretary of State, um, the former Obama officials are now kind of uh, serving as the brain trust of the Democratic Party. Um, and it, it looks like the Democratic Party in 2020 is going to have, um, as part of its platform, uh, a return to the JCPOA. And these officials, these former Obama officials, are coming to Europe and they're going to the Iranians. They're, they're, you know, Kerry met with Zarif, and they're saying, keep the deal on a low burner and keep it alive or on life support until we come back. Because you know, if, if, we, if we take the presidency in 2020, then we can go back to the, um, we can go back to the JCPOA and, and, you know, and we're off to the races in Obama's foreign policy again. And uh, that's why I, I, I don't agree with the point that, that you made is that um, I don't think that the Europeans um, are want to play good cop to Trump's bad cop, and there's an agreement between the two of them of what the final outcome they want. If, if that were the case, if, if, we, if we had really, you, you know, rhetorically we always say, well, we have the same goals, but we just have different ways of getting, of, of getting there. If that were the case, that would be great. But I don't believe we actually have the same goals. Right. And, we, and we Americans are divided among ourselves. Mm -hmm. What President Obama wanted to do was to bring Iran into the family of legitimate nations and make it, a, 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 if not a partner, on, on regional security issues, at least somebody with whom we could have a, a strategic accommodation. Uh, and, and the Republican view, if I could put it that way, or the, the Trump view, I don't know how to label it, the hardline view, is that we actually have to defeat the Islamic Republic. Um, and so I, I think that the, the, the gaps between the, the, the Americans on, on this are are so great that it's dangerous to start opening the door to the idea of <clears throat> good cop, bad cop. I see. Um, now, certainly now the uh, European consensus is that the nuclear deal was uh, supposedly only about the nuclear file and nothing else. But there were, though, um, uh, hopes at the time that the deal through engagement would also moderate the regime. Uh, how has that panned out, Anders? <laughs> I think that was a very flawed concept from the very beginning. But if we see the actual results, we are seeing a stepping up of uh, Iranian interference in the region. We are seeing it all across uh, to the Mediterranean Sea through uh, Iraq, Syria and, and Lebanon. We are seeing it going down into the Arab Peninsula, uh, most, uh, most predominantly in in, in, in um, uh, Yemen, but also in uh, Bahrain and in Qatar. Um, so, so we are seeing that the Iranians have used this deflection uh, where oh, everyone look at the nuclear, look at the nuclear to actually engage more actively in a destabilization in the region. But from a European point of view, even more concerning, we are seeing these assassinations and attempted assassination on European soil. And I'm 
appalled by the European reaction. We saw a strong reaction and a justified reaction for the Russians in Salisbury. We have seen a strong reaction against the Saudis with the incidents in Istanbul. But we have uh, been having to draw the, the, uh, the high representative just to, to, to at least accept that we are seeing exactly the same behavior from Iran. Mm. And it's crazy that this so-called European value-based foreign affairs policy uh, apparently values some assassinations as less important than others. And to a large extent, it is, it is to my understanding, uh, almost unbelievable that the Europeans are so naive when it comes to Iran. And, and I oftentimes describe it that it seems sometimes the European Union take the view that whatever the US is doing in the Middle East is wrong, and per default, we'll do the opposite. Mm. So if we, the Americans are coming to us saying Iran is bad, we must think something good about Iran. If they're coming and saying that Saudi Arabia is a reliable ally, we can only say bad things about Saudi Arabia. And this goes through through every aspect, even to the to the situation in Israel uh, and, and Turkey. So, so, um, so in that sense, uh, the Western powers are completely all over the map when it comes to the wider Middle East question. Now, it might be worth recounting some of these activities here uh, that the Iranian regime, not even through proxies like Hezbollah, has been carried out. There were uh, terror and assassination plots targeting Jewish targets in Germany, including kindergartens. Uh, there were a plot. There was a plot to um, uh, blow up a, uh, a uh, conference for conference, exile uh, Iranians uh, in, in in Paris. Exactly, attended by many American European politicians, including party colleagues uh, yep. of yours. There were um, and there was an assassination attempt in in uh, an, actually a, an assassination that was actually successful in in the Netherlands, mm. and an attempt in Copenhagen. And it was the Danish government that pushed through in many ways, they're still relatively cautious, but uh, some sort of very targeted uh, sanctions. What, now, now, what does it explain? I mean, we, when, when we have actual state-sponsored and orchestrated uh, terrorism on, on, on European soil, uh, one would think that this would be definitely now trigger yeah. a, 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 a adequate response. What explains really this hesitation even in the face of this uh, aggression? I think the Iranians have, have uh, taken a, a play out of the North Korean play, playbook here. When they are openly secret trying to develop a nuclear possibility, that is, becomes the only issue on the table. Mm. So everything else that could have been there, from human rights, from how they act in the neighborhood, to how they act in Europe, to whatever they are doing, takes the back seat. So when the nuclear table, when the nuclear question is on the table, that's the only thing on the table. And, and it's actually, if you are a, a regime like that, it's a quite clever way to deflect from all the other things. You know, don't look here, don't look here, but we have the nuclear issue we can talk about. And uh, and and I, I see that that in many ways, in, in the diplomatic way they are going about this, they're doing exactly what the North Koreans have been doing for, for many, many years. Now the North Koreans have the capability, but for many years that was the, one of the reasons that we could not interfere in the great gross violations that North Korea have, have also done all over the world, from what they're doing to their own population, to assassinations that they're carrying out, to adoptions, uh, abductions uh, on, on, on foreign citizens and so on and so forth. And I think the Iranians are using the nuclear issue exactly the same way in the process until they get the bomb. But I think the ultimate goal is not just to play around. The ultimate goal for the Iranian regime is to get the bomb and, and, uh, and become member of the, nuclear, the most unstable and unreliable member of the nuclear family. Mm. Uh, Mike, particularly since, as Anders said, there is a, a difference of, of views of, of the role that, that Iran plays uh, in, in, in the region. Can you lay out from the US perspective, from the Trump administration's perspective, what is the strategic threat that Iran <clears throat> poses? The, the big threat is um, what, I, what I think we would call the, the hegemonic aspirations of the, of the Iranians. They want to become the dominant power in the, in the region. And they've developed this tool for spreading their uh, their influence, which uh, I'd call the the Hezbollah model. They use proxies based on the on Hezbollah, and the Hezbollah actually helps them to develop these proxies. Um, you know, militias that they build up under the nose of legitimate governments, whether it's in Iraq, um, Lebanon, Yemen, Syria. Even now, they're 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 doing it. Um, uh, it's a relatively cost-free, uh, relatively low-cost strategy. 
Um, they don't have to use Iranians to do it. They can build up uh, either local militias or they can take Afghans and others and, and in the case of Syria and, and take them to Syria. Um, and they combine that now with, with ballistic missiles and, and with uh, smart missiles. Um, and so you have these, uh, you have uh, militias with missile capabilities that are that are uh, superior to what most regular armies have in the um, uh, in the region, and they're basically being controlled uh, by Iran. And I think they want to continue to spread this. They now are, you know, brag uh, legitimately of uh, controlling four capitals. You know, we can argue whether they actually control uh, Baghdad or not, but they certainly have a lot of influence there. As a, re as a result of this strategy. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, we look at that, we look at the way they have been um, under the Obama administration and then continuing somewhat under the Trump administration, the way they've been lapping up territory mm -hmm. um, and influence. And you can see that within a decade, they will have the ability uh, to, um, uh, to pursue their nuclear aspirations without any limitations. Um, and the combination of a power like that with the, uh, Ballistic missiles and uh, nuclear uh, uh, nuclear capability to back up its proxies uh, on the ground is quite a scary thing. I mean, it's going it, to it will um, <clears throat> even apart from the the actual power projection capability of the Iranians that it represents, it will um, inevitably result in nuclear pro proliferation in the region. And we'll suddenly have three or four nuclear powers all facing off against each other. That's a kind of um, national security threat that we are, or security threat that the West has, has never faced. And I, I don't know who, you know, who has the brain power to think through how you deal with that. I mm. mean, I, I think the smart thing to do is to not let it happen in the first right. place. Now, you alluded to it that the U.S. may not have a 100% coherent policy to push back, but what is the U.S. doing at the moment? What ought it to be doing? And perhaps bring us a little bit up to date about the U.S. troops uh, deployment in, in Syria, which seems to be going back and forth uh, from, 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 from week to week. Let me start with the last one on the, the Syria point. Uh, um, there, there have been reports recently that we're, we're going to leave as many as 1,000 or 2,000 troops in Syria. Um, I don't actually believe those. I, I, think we should, I think we should listen to what Trump said, hmm. uh, mainly because that was an election promise. Um, and um, whatever you uh, think about Donald Trump, you have to admit that he has been um, remarkably, uh, r remarkably uh, focused on actually um, uh, keeping his promises to the electorate in the 2016. How many campaign. how many troops are there now at the moment? Um, the, not that many. We, we, uh, the number that was thrown out is 2,000. Uh, some people uh, some people say that with the clandestine forces, mm. it gets closer to 4,000. Um, the exact number, who knows? Um, uh, in the last week, they said, we're going to keep 1,000 there. But then the, the chief of staff said, no, that's not going to happen. Um, I think that we should be assuming that the, that that it's gonna it's gonna be um, a few hundred by the time the by the time the dust settles and 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 mainly in a um, mainly in an intelligence gathering capability uh, capacity rather than um, force projection. Um, the uh, the strategy is. In this sense, there's a there's a there's a continuity between Obama to Trump. Uh, the, the goal of both of them, pre both presidents, is to keep the Middle East at arm's length, to keep the United States from getting directly involved in these conflicts on, on the ground. Um, Obama's strategy for doing that was to bring the Iranians and the Russians into the, uh, into the security calculations of the United States, or, or turn them into um, into partners, basically, or, or at least, um, you know, members of a concert system where we could uh, agree on, um, uh, on some common threats like ISIS or uh, Al-Qaeda that we would work together to eliminate and we would um, agree on red lines that we would, uh, that we would all, um, that we that would all adhere to so as to not uh, to, to not get into conflict with each other. Um, you saw that the minute the JCPOA was signed, John Kerry brought the Iranians into the negotiations on, the, on, on Syria. 
He didn't bring the Israelis in. The Israelis have a border with, 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 with Syria, but they were left out, but the Iranians were brought in because they have proxies on the ground and because they wanted to co-opt the Iranians. The, 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 mm. the Obama administration's dream and the European Union's dream was to, was to make the Iranians partners of, of sort in all, in, in all this. The Trump view is that uh, we need to contain Iran, we need to defeat Iran in certain, in certain respects, uh, and uh, the way to do that is to work through traditional allies. So the continuity between Obama and Trump is that, Obama, that Trump, like Obama, doesn't want large numbers of forces on, on, on the ground. The solution, then, is to use proxies, to use allies. President Obama moved away from the traditional allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel in particular, also Turkey, and Trump is making an effort to work with all of them. The, the Saudis, the Israelis, and the Turks. The, the hardest nut to crack there, of course, is the Turks. Right. Um, May your last question to you. Uh, um, uh, now you also hear from Europeans, from European capitals, that they do realize that Iran is obviously playing a nefarious role in the region, and they are rhetorically ready to work also with the Americans. Uh, but what is it actually that Europeans are willing to do and are capable of doing? Um, that's a good question. I think, first of all, it would be very, very good if we can get closer to talking with a common voice. And I think the European move, how small it was in the end in starting to impose sanctions on Iran was a right move to at least start to bridge the gap. Also, just to get, go a little bit off topic, the agreement in Venezuela was also good actually to start some diplomatic talks between the EU and the US on, on foreign affairs, so maybe that will spill over into more concrete discussions. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, how efficient that Europe can make sanctions. It's very clear that the Iranians are seeing some openings in Europe and uh, whether we can close them or are willing to close them or not is a big question. I don't think we will be with this special vehicle. But I think many things could actually change with this upcoming election. But I'm not overly optimistic in the sense that even concrete assassination and assassination attempts on European soil have, have bolstered such a weak response that took months to, to just utilize into weak sanctions. It shows that, that the Europeans uh, are doing this with their hands behind the back, forced to do it. They are not really doing it because they think that they need to contain Iran. They do it because it lets the only, that's the least proportionate way of responding to Iran's actions. Well, thank you both for this uh, interesting discussion. That's uh, all the time we have today. Um, see you hopefully all uh, next month for a new episode of Counterpoint. Until then, goodbye from the European Parliament.